Hey, how is everybody? This is Andrew from Unitarian Apologetics. The title of this video, as you can see, is 1 Corinthians 8, 6, One God, One Lord, and the Messianic Feast. Exploring the true context of 1 Corinthians 8, 6. In this video, I'm going to explore the view that the verse in question, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, is actually a reference to the Christ event and a certain people rather than the idea that the Lord Jesus was somehow involved in the creation of the universe. The verse in question, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, we read, Yet to us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and we through him. Exploring the different views in his book, Keys to First Corinthians, Jerome Murphy O'Connor in chapter 6 poses the question, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, cosmology or soteriology? So if we see it from a cosmological view, we might uh, read the verse as if the Lord Jesus was involved in the creation of the universe, to where if we see it from a strictly soteriological viewpoint, we might read it that this is referring to the um, salvific Christ event and all things that have come through Christ as a result of that event. On page 64, we read, the cosmological interpretation of 1 Corinthians 8, 6 is inspired by the presence of the double ta panta. Ta panta is essentially a relative term. It means all things within a given framework, and it derives its specific meaning from the context in which it is found. So it doesn't necessarily have to mean that it's referring to the entire universe, although we do see it used um, as such. Um, but the but the meaning is, is uh, going to be found from the context in which it is found. And so let us explore that context. So we have a little bit of Old Testament background. And I encourage you after this, go back and read Ezekiel 34, no matter what your view is. Um, so we can learn more about our Messiah, who he was expected to be and who he is to us. Ezekiel 34, 23 through 24, we read, I will appoint over them one shepherd, my servant David. Of course, we know that this is approximately 400 years after David, so it's a reference to someone of the house of David, as we all uh, universally agree to be the Messiah, Jesus. Yahweh says, I will appoint over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them. He will feed them and be their shepherd. I, Yahweh, will be their God, and my servant David will be a prince among them. So already when we read there's one God the Father and one Lord Jesus Christ, we have a background um, um, context from which to draw. And um, please compare that with Jeremiah 3.15. Uh, we read in the classic book, The Lord's Anointed, interpretation of Old Testament messianic texts on page 216. As prince, he stands at the head of his people, not as a tyrannical ruler, but as one who has been called from their ranks to represent them. As one shepherd, he will seek the welfare of his flock, protecting and nurturing them after the pattern of Yahweh himself. And please compare that with Micah 5.4. In the book, Echoes of a Prophet, so later we see um, Jesus as the Good Shepherd in John 10. This is from Gary T. Manning Jr. on page 116. He writes, there are some other important parallels between John's Jesus and Ezekiel's David. Although David is never called the Good Shepherd, he is clearly presented as good in contrast with the wicked shepherds of Israel. The mention of one shepherd likely not only refers to the United Kingdom, but also to David's eternal reign. There will be no other king after him. 
David's rule is clearly secondary to God's in Ezekiel, however. David is only appointed after God himself has eliminated the wicked sheep and shepherds, and God is the one who brings down the eschatological blessings on his people. David rules as vassal prince over Israel, while God is the suzerain king. David does exactly what God does. He is faithful shepherd who feeds God's flocks. Although David is subordinate to God, their actions are united. Again, when we read, I and the Father are one, in the Good Shepherd narrative, we know that David does exactly what God does. He is a faithful shepherd who feeds God's flocks. Although David is subordinate to God, their actions are united. So we have a better background when we get to that verse as well as 1 Corinthians 8, 6. All right, so... We know that when Paul writes for us, that this is only addressing a specific people, there's no need to specify for us if it referred to every single person or thing. So it, so um, Paul, is by, by specifying for us, is in contrast with those who are not. So if every single person or thing came through the creative act of of, of the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, there would be no need to specify for us. And this is highlighted in Stephen Turley's book, The Ritualized Revelation of the Messianic Age, where he writes, while all things are from God the Father and through Christ, we for him in 86a and we through him in 86b demonstrate that among all things in the cosmos, only the Corinthians are equally in him or through him. So I would say not only um, those in Corinth, but the letter itself is written to a specific people. We read here, 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 3. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. And so we have a better idea from the context of Corinthians. Um about what all things mean. See, we read, one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and we through him. All right, in 1 Corinthians 1, 27 and 29 through 30, we read, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. By God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So again, um, a lot of people like to use the verse comparing Jesus with wisdom, and they, they read only um, in verse 24, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, um, but fail to keep reading <clears throat> where we read that Christ became to us wisdom from God. So wisdom already existed in the world, but Christ has now become to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And so I made this note at the bottom. All things denotes the totality of things that come from God through Christ. Those who are in Christ share and participate in these things. So righteousness, sanctification, redemption, these are the sort of things that Paul has in mind when he says all things. All right. So if we back up one verse, 1 Corinthians 8, 5, we read, therefore, concerning the things sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no God except one. And later in the video, in part three of this video, we will um, address food sacrificed to idols. But right now I want to focus on the latter part, truly, if indeed there are those called gods, whether in heaven 
or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords. So the contrast is between gods in heaven or lords on earth. We'll see that um, parallel again. This is from Caesar and Sacrament by Alan Street. He writes, the principal declaration of the Christ movement in the first century was Jesus is Lord. Since Jesus is the one Lord, Caesar and all other claimants are not. At the time of this writing, Emperor Nero claimed to be the universal Lord and Jupiter's earthly representative. So the contrast is these um, false gods such as Jupiter, Apollo, these guys like this, in contrast with the earthly representatives such as Nero or Caesar. And again, we read in Radical Martyrdom by Paul Middleton, for the Corinthians, there was but one Lord and one God. But Romans knew that there were many lords and gods. The emperor was thought to be a mediator of sorts between heaven and earth, representing humans to the gods, and also representing the gods and their powers to humans. Therefore, Christ was Lord. So no one can say Christ is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So I think by having the Holy Spirit, we have insight, understanding that, that there's one true God and that the kingdom, um, which now belongs to Christ, is not of this world. So by the Holy Spirit, we can say Christ is Lord in contrast with an emperor such as Caesar or Nero. A quick summary of this part of the video. I believe this video gives us a better summary of the all things which have come through Christ Jesus and that the more reasonable interpretation of this verse pertains to the salvation and reconciliation of God's people. The one God is the one God of Israel, the Father, Yahweh. In contrast with the many false gods, for example, Zeus, Apollo, Athena, Jupiter, etc., and the one Lord is the Davidic Messiah, Jesus, in contrast with the many lords, for example, Caesar, Nero, or later Domitian. All right, getting into the text um, that many use to try to um, claim pre-existence about um, the tradition of the rock that followed them. We read in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4, For I do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking the spiritual rock accompanying them, and the rock was Christ. All right. But when we keep reading down in verse 11, now these things happen to them as types and were written for our admonition or warnings for us to whom the ends of the ages are arrived. <laughs> all right. So this is all these things were written as types uh, that were fulfilled in Christ. In John Byron's article, which I will, um, I will put in a link at the bottom of my video, um, he wrote an article about the moving rock. Well, he says, if one isn't reading carefully, it's easy to miss Paul's claim that the rock Moses struck to give the Israelites water followed them around the desert. But compare Paul's claim with the Hebrew Bible which nowhere states that the rock followed Israel around the desert, much less that Jesus was present in the shape of a rock. Um, Peter Inns, in his famous article, Movable Well in 1 Corinthians 10.4, an extra biblical tradition in an apostolic text, tells us that Paul is a mere witness, quote, to a tradition that is itself the end product of exegetical activity. All right, we're going to take a look at that exegetical activity and see how the um, certain writers and people understood that text and how the tradition came about. All right, and first, 
This is from the book Israel in the Wilderness. Um, we read, the New Testament writers are consonant in their view that Jesus Christ was a new Moses, leading them through his death and resurrection, a new exodus for a newly reconstituted people of God. Against this backdrop, we can make sense of Paul's elusive words in 1 Corinthians 10.3 when he writes, they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. The inference which Paul allows his Corinthians readers to draw is that Christ's presence in the Lord's Supper follows the pattern of a, div of a divine presence in the Israelites' manner. So again, we see that these things happen as types to them. We see Jesus as the new Moses. This is uh, 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 simply Christ's um, uh, types and shadows type situation where Christ um, has fulfilled. And these things um, and happened in the Old Testament. Um, for instance, being baptized into Moses, having the same spiritual food and drink, it parallels Christ in the new Exodus. All right, so the two times when in when we read in the Old Testament about this rock, first we read in Exodus 17, 3 through 6, then also in Numbers 21, 17 through 18. But the people thirsted for water there and they grumbled against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? Then Moses cried out to Yahweh. What should I do with these people? A little more, and they will stone me. And Yahweh said to Moses, Walk on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take along in your hand the, the staff which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand there before you by the rock at Oreb. When you strike the rock, water will come out of it for the people to drink. So this is the first time. Second time we read, from there they went on to beer, which actually means well in Hebrew, I believe. The well where Yahweh said to Moses, gather the people so that I may give them water. Then Israel sang this song, spring up, O well, all of you sing to it. The princess dug the well, the nobles of the people hollowed it out with their scepters and with their staffs. All right. So if you keep reading, again, we read about the rock. Sorry about that. So some extra biblical sources for the movable rock well tradition. In Pseudophilo's book of biblical antiquities, we read, And there in the desert he commanded him, Moses, many things and showed him the tree of life, from which he cut off and took and threw it into Mara, and the water of Mara became sweet. And it, the water, followed them in the wilderness for 40 years and went up to the mountain with them and went down into the plains. Targum Onkelos to Numbers 21, 16 through 20. So Israel offered this praise, rise, O well, sing to it. The well which the princes dug, the leaders of the people dug, the scribes with their staffs, and it was given to them since wilderness times. Now since it, was, since it was given to them, it went down with them to the valleys, and from the valleys it went up with them to the high country. So they had this tradition of the well following them around in the desert, which is, um, a, not, which is a tradition not found in the, in the actual Hebrew Bible. All right, and so we read from John Byron again, adding to the possible weight, adding possible weight to this exegesis in Psalm 105, 41, which states, he opened the rock and water gushed out. It went through the desert like a river. <clears throat> the it here is ambiguous. Did the rock travel the desert or the water? Once again, some interpreters concluded that it was the rock that followed them. So I think here's where we see a lot of trouble in certain interpretations. I think reading this in the Hebrew Bible, 
it's clear that when we read, he opened the rock and water gushed out, it went through the desert like a river, that what's being talked about is the water going through the desert like a river. But some read it as if the rock went with them through the desert like a river. All right. In Richard Hayes' commentary on 1 Corinthians, we read, The legend that the rock, or well, had followed Israel in its travels through the desert is amply documented in rabbinic tradition, which also I have evidence that before Paul's day, the provision of water for Israel in the wilderness was attributed to divine wisdom, and that Philo, Paul's near contemporary in Alexandria, allegorically identified the rock itself as the wisdom of God. Quote, for the flinty rock is the wisdom of God, which he marked off highest and chiefest from his powers, and from which he satisfies the thirsty souls that love God. With such ideas in the air, it is not difficult to see how Paul might have hit upon the notion of identifying the rock metaphorically with Christ, since the transference of attributes of divine wisdom to Christ was already a common interpretive practice in early Christianity. Such language is clearly figurative. All right, so the final part of this video, we read about food sacrifice to idols. What does that mean? I believe if some if some read that um, as Christ, um, uh, Lord Jesus, involved uh, somehow in the creation of the universe, you'd read that passage to say that concerning the things, food, sacrifice to idols, we know that an idol is nothing, that God made the world and he made it through Jesus. Therefore, you can eat whatever you, uh, food you want, even if it's sacrificed to idols but nothing could be farther from the truth. We read, therefore, concerning the things uh, sacrificed to idols, 1 Corinthians 8, 5. We read this in the book, In Christ, in Paul's exploration of, in, uh, in Paul, oh, in Christ, in Paul, explorations in Paul's theology of union and participation, addressing the issue of whether or not believers should eat food sacrificed to idols, Paul argues that though idols are nothing, quote, the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. So the idea there is more that the gods are not real. The, um, the idols are not real, but there's demonic activity going on uh, participating with them. Um, he then goes on to say that they cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too, nor have a part in the Lord's table and that of demons. This is the conclusion of Paul's ethical point here, but it is probably grounded in the fact that the sharing in the body of Christ, probably referring to his physical body given in death, in the Lord's Supper, which constitutes the one body, referring to the community of Christ's people, points to a real spiritual situation. Participating in the body of Christ is not mere metaphor. It is a spiritual reality that has consequences for believers' actions in the physical world. All right. And again, when we, when we, when we go down to 1 Corinthians 8.10, we see a contrast here between eating in an idol's temple in eating food sacrificed to idol. All right, we read in 8.10, for someone with a weak conscience sees you who are well-informed eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged to eat food sacrificed to idols? So there's a contrast here. So you could see someone eating in an idol's temple, but not necessarily eating food sacrificed to idols. Paul doesn't want people to be encouraged to eat food sacrificed to idols. All right. So, so we have a better um, understanding of this. We read in Gordon Fee's first epistle to the Corinthians, page 397. The meals in pagan temples were also intensely social occasions for the participants. For the most part, the Gentiles who had become believers in Corinth 
have probably attended such meals all their lives. Indeed, such meals served as the basic restaurants in antiquity and every kind of occasion was celebrated in this fashion. So doesn't necessarily mean that it's a celebration um, for a certain god or emperor, <clears throat> but rather that they served as the basic restaurants in antiquity. So what Paul is saying, I believe, is that it, it's not a problem if you want to eat there because it's, because it's just food, but the idea of it being sacrificed to an idol is a completely uh, separate situation. And Paul never says it's okay to eat food sacrificed to idols. And that's, um, that's idolatry and is spoken about at numerous places in the New Testament as well. Um, some of the meals, however, were sacrificed to certain gods and emperors. Um, we read in the, the, um, the well-noted book, Idol Meat in Corinth by Wendell Willis. Meals among worshipers were a common feature of sacrifice in Hellenistic religions. While sacrifice was not a daily or even weekly event in Hellenistic life, neither was it a thing of great rarity. There were a variety of sacrificial occasions, including sacrifice to a particular deity, of which there were many, state festivals, and also various private associations with a religious or at least a quasi-religious base. So notice he puts, and then down in the notes, he puts both public deities, such as Jupiter or Athena, or more private cults, such as Asclepius or Dionysus. So Paul doesn't want people um, eating food sacrificed to these gods or idols, but if it was just a meal that took place in the temple, it's not a problem. The people with the weak conscience, as Paul would say, say would say even though you're even eating in a temple i believe that you're eating food sacrificed to god and so paul says if i cause my brother to stumble um i'll never eat meat again so paul says it's better instead of taking this liberty in your understanding that it's okay to eat at these um quote unquote restaurants in the temples um it's better to to not make your um, brother stumble if, if he doesn't have the same understanding or beliefs that you do. All right. In um, his book, Subversive Meals, an analysis of the Lord's Supper under Roman domination in the, during the first century, Allen Street again writes, a modern day communion service in which a symbolic piece of cracker and a thimble sized portion of wine are distributed to the faithful had no counterpart in the first century church. When early believers gathered in a home, courtyard, or hall to partake of the Lord's Supper, they reclined at a table in Greco-Roman fashion and ate a full course meal. It was a joyous time for sharing food, honoring Christ, and using their gifts, talents, and resources to minister to one another. The communal meals eaten in Jesus' name differed mainly from other forms of meals of that era in that they focused on Christian theology rather than Roman ideology. All right. And so we have a better idea about what, what the intention of these, of these meals and these gathering and being in Christ is. This is, um, from the book, You Belong to Christ, Paul and the Formation of Social Identity in 1 Corinthians by Brian Tucker. He writes, Paul's desire for holiness within his communities has its basis in the Corinthians' participation with Christ. He argues that they may have been sanctified. He argues that they have been sanctified by means of Christ Jesus. The implications of this union with Christ include a sense of consecration, which leads to a reorientation of the Corinthians' moral framework, a re-socialization of their social structures, and a reconfiguration of their cognitive outlook. All of these are evident in 1 Corinthians 1-4 through and combine to strengthen the Corinthians' identity in Christ. So being in Christ 
while having specific soteriological implications is to be understood within the framework of an emo- emerging social identity. So again, everything changes when we're in Christ. The way we, the way we um, socialize, our cognitive outlook, our moral framework, everything has come from God and through Christ. And um, those who are in Christ participated in these things as the body of Christ. And um, all right. So if you have any questions um, or suggestions um, or you just want to talk about this, um, please feel free to message me. Uh, you can email me at unitarianapologetics at gmail.com. You can uh, find me on Facebook. Um, feel free to um, share this video, um, comment, and uh, let's talk about this. I hope this video blesses you and that you learned and grew as much as I did. Um, God bless.